Hey guys, so today I'm going to be cooking tri-tip and we're going to be doing it outside where it's really, really cold. Uh, so I thought I'd go into a little bit of smoke man smoker management tips before we begin. Um, there's been some questions about uh, when I sell a smoker to someone or help someone get one set up or show them how to barbecue about whether or not you use the stack, the little register up on the stack to uh, control the heat or they use the, the air intake. Uh, on the side of the offset smoker and uh, it's it's kind of both but it's mainly that stack and so since it's a really cold day out uh, and my temperature swings are going to be more than usual uh, I figured it'd be a, a good time to kind of talk about uh, smoker management so I'm going to show you a picture so I can illustrate what I'm talking about here uh, this this is an offset smoker of course and this is one that i rebuilt for a friend of mine in, a, in another video that you can see um but over here we have the firebox here we have the cooking chamber and here we have the stack and then we have this control up here on top of the uh, top of the stack that is what i would say 80 to 90 percent of the control of the heat of my fire comes from is right there uh, and and i'll go into the reason for that in previous videos i've talked about the need to have uh a complete burn happening with your hardwoods. You need to have a really hot fire that, that's oxidizing all the way to get it hot enough to combust the lignin in the hardwoods. Because the lignin, when it burns, turns into serangel and glycol, and those are the oils deposited on our food that makes it taste and smell like barbecue. Uh, if you have a, a, a smoldering fire that's, that's a lot cooler uh, and, and you've choked it down, then you do have the hemicellulose and the cellulose burning, but a lot of the acids and oils produced from that are not conducive to good barbecue, and you don't get a hot enough uh, fire to depolymerize that lignin. And so that's the, the whole point is when we're smoking with one of these, we want a really, really, really hot fire here. But the problem with that is that uh, the, the thinking is that that hot fire will translate all that energy to your cook chamber and won't have too, too hot of a cook chamber. That's where this little control right here comes in, this little regulator on the top of the stack. So uh, without going too far into what the stack effect is and how that pressure differential works, what I like to do personally is build a really hot fire here so we have that depolymerization of our hardwoods happening to a very large degree. Sometimes I even open this door up and let that air just really flood on into here. And then what controls how much of that heat goes into the cook chamber versus out the louvers or out the door is this right here. If I open that just a crack, it's only going to pull enough heat, that much heat, into this. And I can open it up more and it pulls more heat into here. And it's a, it's a very fine degree of, of change you can get on, on, your, on the heat of your cook chamber by using this little control on top of your stack. Um, uh, you can have, like I say, you can have the door wide open. And if there's a huge fire here, a lot of that heat's just going to come right out the door and right out these louvers. This determines how much of that heat and smoke is pulled into your cook chamber. That's how I do it. Uh, everyone does it a little bit different. Everyone explains it a little bit different. Another way you might think of it, because of the stack effect, you have this column of hot air right here. So you have a high pressure, pressure differential between here and down here. This lets that lets that pressure out and pulls more air in way more than if you open this uh, up. It's not going to force exhaust out here. This pulls the exhaust out. Another way to think about the heat in your, in your offset smoker is like a rope. So if you strung a rope through here and up here, you can't push on this rope. You can't ever push a rope. But you right here, you can pull on that rope. And the rope is like the heat. So always think of this right here as pulling heat from your fire chamber into your into your cooking chamber. And I, the only reason I'm going so far into this today is because I'm going to be cooking uh, in, a, in a very cold environment. And the fact that it's a very thick, quarter-inch thick steel smoker helps a lot with heat recovery. Uh, but there are more challenges. There's a hard north wind blowing today, and we're cooking beef tri-tips. So it's a semi-long cook. Uh, we smoke them for about five hours. So let's get into the video. So this is what a tri-tip looks like when you get it from the grocery store. Sometimes they're vacuum packed, uh, but a tri-tip is a part of the sirloin. The sirloin is a group of muscles behind the loin, uh, you know, behind the ribeye and the New York strip and all that. And before you get to the rear end of the cow where the rump and stuff is, and the bottom of the sirloin descends into this kind of triangular piece when they cut it off, hence the name. So there's kind of three distinct advantages to cooking uh, smoking rather uh, tri-tip one is you don't have to trim that much so you're not throwing that much away uh, when you're, uh, you're cooking it like you would when you're trimming a brisket 
The second one is that it does taste a lot like brisket. It's very close in texture to the point end of the brisket. It's, it's well marbled and has a lot of feathery fat in the inside. Uh, and the third thing is it's a, it's a smaller cut. It's, it's a more family sized portion than a huge brisket. So it gives you some variability in deciding what size cut you want to cook. If you want to cook some brisket and you don't want to cook a 15 pound, you know, $85 brisket, you can buy a tri-tip. And as I said, there's not much trimming to do. I'm trimming off any of the little tiny thin pieces that would burn up or get too crispy. And every time I trim, I like to round them off as you can see here. That way it doesn't leave any sharp edges that would get crispy or burn up too much. But tri-tips just don't need that much. See this little descending piece here, it's really thin. Go ahead and knock that off. But otherwise, you just don't do too much to them. You don't waste too much at all. There were three of them left at the store on sale, so I bought all three, and I'll be cooking all three today on Oklahoma Joe's Offset Smoker. It's pretty chilly out, so we'll build a little bit larger fire than normal and have to manage it a little bit different, but that's, that's barbecue. These are all about four pounds each. Pretty, pretty normal size for a tri-tip. Just like brisket, I'm gonna go ahead and inject these today. Uh, but your barbecue makes a great brisket uh, injection that I use every time I cook brisket or fry tip. It's really easy to, to mix this stuff up. You just follow the directions on the side and mix it up really well with some water. And then you can load it up in your injection needle and, and, and inject these guys. I like to do it the night before. I think it adds a little more depth of flavor, but today we're just gonna do it right before we cook. So you just load your needle up and then every few inches, uh, you know, just, just inject your solution into these, into these cuts. It actually, you can tell when you're pushing it in there, it actually puffs up. You can see it inflating that meat with that brine just a little bit in this close-up shot. And then any of that extra uh, kind of injection liquid that, that's on the outside, I just rub it on the outside of the cut and then that that makes my dry rub adhere a lot better so that's that's kind of the way i do it when i inject and i just kind of eyeball it and go in every few inches and try and get to the middle of the muscle if possible and i'm going to dry rub today with Payne county rust this is my own seasoning i really like it on beef it's good on chicken and, and shrimp and vegetables and all kinds of stuff it's an all-meat seasoning uh, but uh, when it comes to beef, I just think it's, it's a superior rub. It's really, really good. So if I'm doing beef ribs or I'm doing brisket or tri-tip, I use Payne County Rust, and that's what I'm using today. You'll notice I do the fat side second so that it's sitting up and it's not sitting down on the fat side on the cutting board because I cook fat side up when it comes to beef. Um, I like to protect the fat side because that's where I think the bark is the tastiest. It's the, f the bark that forms on the fat side. So I cook fat side up. You can tell it's really chilly today. Uh, this morning the wind chills are in the negatives and so we're going to use a little bit more charcoal and a little bit more wood than normal and then we'll just use that uh, adjustment on the stack to pull as much heat as we need into the cooking chamber. A really common way for me to light these smaller uh, offset smokers is to use a paper towel that's been wicked in used vegetable oil. Some of you people who watch these videos I make are probably getting tired of hearing me say this, but I like to go over it each time in case this is someone's first video to watch. And so you just wad up some used paper towels or new ones, whatever, or some newspaper and stuff it in the bottom of the charcoal chimney and then pour some cooking oil over it like this. I use used cooking oil when I've deep fried something and that really gets a hot, hot burn. Uh, going to start this charcoal in this chimney. Then I pour a little bit more oil over the top. Just a really efficient way to reuse your oil and, and, and get these fires going really hot. Every time I smoke, I like to uh, wipe down the grates with a poly brush and then I spray pan release all over those grates and wipe it off with a paper towel. And that kind of seasons that metal up and gets it all polished and ready ready to accept the cuts pour some more charcoal on here a little bit more wood and we'll uh we'll get this cook 
box up to temperature. About every other time, or maybe every three times, I like to spray the outside of my firebox on my smokers with pan release. That pan release will burn on there and polymerize and turn into a really good protective coating. And it was time to do it on this one for sure. So I'm gonna take this opportunity to do that today also. Just cheap pan release, vegetable oil. So here's those tri-tips, and I'm gonna load them up on the far side of the smoker here, away from the fire. I generally only cook on the on the far, far half or two-thirds of the smoker. It's just, there's a lot of convective energy coming out of that, coming out of that uh, fire box over there, and I just kind of stay away from that right third of the smoker. And then we'll put a probe thermometer in, just for the heck of it. Doesn't really matter what internal temperature we're going to for the smoke phase, but I like to keep an eye on it. We're gonna look for good bark, and that's all we're gonna look for. And I know it's gonna take four or five hours. I'm gonna put a little extra rust on here. Rust is mild enough where you can put quite a bit on there and not, over, not risk over salting your product. So I'm putting it on there again where I've handled these roasts and, and kind of knocked some of the bark off to make sure I have a really good dry rub on the outside of these tri-tips to get some good bark on that fat. And after about two and a half hours, you can see that bark is well formed. It's now set up and we can go ahead and start spraying. I'm just using water today to keep it from burning. And I'll spray about every hour. I'm gonna smoke these about five or five and a half hours today to get the bark where I want it before we're gonna go into a braise. It didn't stop snowing all day long. You know, there's this dichotomy people often say that they don't like to cook out or grill out or barbecue in the winter, but they like comfort food in the winter. And to me, barbecue is the ultimate comfort food. I, I smoke on my barbecues, uh, on my smokers rather, uh, in the fall and in the winter and spring. That's when I do it the most. I cook in the summer too, but boy, I like, I like this weather for, for just getting chores done during the day while your smoker's going. Even if it's bitter cold out, it didn't warm up much at all the whole day long. Just kept snowing. So after about five or five and a half hours, that bark is exactly where I want it. The fat is starting to render on the outside. You can kind of push your finger into it. And we got a dark, dark brown mahogany bark formed on the outside. The smoker can't really do any much, any more uh, to add to the flavor of these, of these roasts at this point. And so I'm going to finish off inside in the oven in a braise. We could finish them off in the smoker also, but I'm going to use the oven today. Those came out just great. Look at that mahogany bark on that fat. It's exactly what I'm looking for. I think their internal temperature is between 160 and 170 at this point. But that fat is rendered and we got a good bark. And I like to double wrap them in heavy duty aluminum foil. I buy this heavy duty aluminum foil at like Sam's or someplace like that. You could buy it in bulk and it's much less expensive. So we'll double wrap these in the foil and put a probe thermometer in it so we can tell when it hits about that 205 or 206 degree mark that we're looking for. Now I have charts on paincountyrust.com under charts and resources tab and you can download and print those and it has all the internal temperatures for all the different meats that you can cook uh, when you're barbecuing. I think it's really helpful. There's a lot of other information on there also, but go over there and check it out and you can download them and print them and kind of look over them before you cook each time. I still have to look at it every now and then. And I'm going to put a separate thermometer in each one of these. Of course, if you just have one internal thermometer with probe on it, um, you'd put it in the smallest roaster, whichever one's going to be done the fastest so that it doesn't overcook when the other ones are done. But I like these little guys. You can get them on Amazon. I think I have some information down at the bottom of this video and all of them on, on which exact internal instant read thermometer this is, uh, but they're very inexpensive. I've had these for a couple years now and they're still working just fine. I don't spend a whole lot of money on my probe thermometers. They might be 15, 16, 17 bucks. And then we'll wait. Done with the smoker outside, but like I say, on a cold day like this, it's a great day to barbecue. The snow just kept coming down, so I'd get some chores done when, I, uh, when everything's finishing up in the oven.
You can see the ladder in the background there. I'm building another chicken facility in back. I'll have a video up on that soon. This is my chicken coop and my hens. They don't like this weather very much, but they're still laying. Getting about four eggs a day out of these five hens. So in a 265 degree oven, about two and a half hours later, we're hitting 205, and they were all actually done at the same time, even though they went in at different internal temperatures. And generally, I like to let them rest in a, in, I let some, some of the heat out of the oven and let them rest in the oven all night long, especially like brisket. But you can also do a vented rest, where you just cut a little bit of a hole in the foil at the top. Be careful not to damage the bark on those really hot roasts in there. Let them sit up here for about an hour and they'll cool down. I like to slice once the product is under 150 degrees. And there is our finished tri-tip. Tri you cut them from end to end because the grain runs the other way, but you can see it looks a lot like brisket. It tastes a lot like brisket. Even the makeup in the inside, the fat content is like the point of a brisket. All that fat on, in this product is perfectly rendered out. Looks really, really good. We really nailed these today. And then you just slice it up just like brisket, or I do. You can also cut it into burn ends if you like, um, but I prefer to slice it up like this, and I'm gonna slice all, all three of these tri-tips up today. Perfectly tender, good smoke ring. Really good bark on this guy, it came out really well. And again, we go from end to end lengthwise, and that'll give you a good cross cross section across the grain cut for these tender tender tri-tips if you've never smoked these before go ahead and try them uh, especially if they're on sale they're a smaller cut they cook up just like brisket they taste a lot like brisket uh, you don't throw quite as much away it's a really efficient way to do things I really hope you guys will try these out uh, I hope you had a good time today and get out there and smoke <music>